Okay, well, welcome to the Arcadia University College of Global Studies lecture series from the Edinburgh Centre. I'm delighted today to be able to introduce Alice Thompson, who is uh, an award-winning Scottish novelist. Uh, Alice won the James Tate Black Memorial Prize in... Uh, in 1996. 96, so, so, so a little, 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 yeah. little wee while ago. And um, she's uh, just published her sixth novel, Burnt Island, that came out in May. Um, although uh, today, this, um, this morning, this afternoon, uh, Alice is going to be talking about The Existential Detective, which was a novel uh, prior to Burnt Island. Alice has also just been uh, listed as uh, on a list of 50 best books to come out of Scotland. Uh, sadly, J.K. Rowling did not make the list. No. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but no children's writer, that's why. This but, is in the past 50 years. This is in the past 50 years, yeah. so, uh, so Alice made the, the list. Alice is currently Programme Director in Creative Writing uh, and Lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. So thank you, thank you very much, Alice. Thank you, Hamish, thank you. I'm going to read, as Hamish said, from my fifth novel, um, The Existential Detective, which is my attempt to um, look at the detective story as a genre and kind of reimagine it. It's something I do with a lot of my books, and um, I like having the starting point of a genre with which to experiment and try and make it slightly new and strange. I'm a great fan of Raymond Chandler and um, Agatha Christie, who I know is quite old-fashioned, but I think she's got a wonderful mind. And Raymond Chandler is a fantastic stylist, and I love his use of imagery. He takes risk with style um, and form, in the sense that some of his books don't actually have a clear idea of who, who's actually done the murder. Um, so I'm going to read, first of all, from the beginning of my book, um, it's set in Portobello, which is a seaside resort in Edinburgh, about three miles outside the centre of Edinburgh. Um, I was also quite um, influenced by a film in the 70s with Burt Lancaster in it, um, Atlantic City. Um, and I think seaside resorts are quite interesting as places um, to set novels because there's something if they're faded and decaying, there's something rather poetic about them. So that's one of the reasons I chose Portobello. Also, my main protagonist, Will, William Blake, um, no relation to the poet, um, is halfway through his life, he's been very disillusioned, and Portobello seemed to me to echo his, his state of mind. It's also where the marginalised often live, and detective stories um, often deal with the marginalised, especially American detective writing. So this is chapter one. Portobello was the place where you could find anonymity, and Will enjoyed the faded seaside resort's genteel seediness, seediness because it demanded nothing from him. The pale deserted promenade that ran along the edge of the flat sea the mishmash of small Georgian cottages and red stone tenements and the amusement arcade seemed to represent to Will his own pleasurable disillusionment. Of medium height, he appeared inconspicuous. He liked to blend into whatever landscape he was walking into and his ashen skin made him look as if he slept under rocks. Dark curly hair overshadowed a strong face which was slightly concave but detachedly handsome as if the world had given him a few punches over the years and then stepped back to admire its handiwork. It was a typical autumn day as Will walked along the promenade. The seagulls were as clamorous as ever. The rain of the night before had been heavy and he could hear the water rushing down the huge pipe that ran beneath the promenade and led directly into the sea. There was no wind. The sea was still. He loved the windless days. Shrugging off his raincoat, Will climbed the stairs to the small office above the fish and chip cafe where he worked and lived. The sign on the door read, William Blake, private investigator. Over time it made him smile, for he investigated the most secret and sordid matters, generally involving infidelity or fraud, until the word private 
had become blurred with his knowledge of other people's lives. He quickly glanced around the room to check nothing had been disturbed. A few days earlier he'd been broken into, a few papers had been rearranged and some old family photos he hadn't looked at in years had been scattered across the floor, but nothing had been taken as far as he could see. In fact, something had been added. He'd found the packaging of a disposable camera in his waste paper bin. Today was a boring day, a few phone calls about forged checks, filial deception and a missing cat. That evening he retired to his living room, which lay at the back of the flat, and looked not over the sea, but over another row of tenement blocks behind. He always entered it with a sense of relief. It was a sanctuary from the chaos. So that gives you an idea of William um, Blake. He's on his own, he's divorced. Um, what happens then is um, a few hours later a man arrives, um, a scientist, who asks Will to look for his missing wife. Um, the missing wife also has amnesia and um, Will decides to search the amusement arcade which is just down the road from where he lives um, to see if he might find clues as to where this missing woman, Louise Verver, has got to. The next morning Will visited the amusement arcade on the promenade. It seemed so ludicrously out of place amongst the grey old stones of the town. The arcade was both an illusion and the face of hard cash, its slot machines tinny and bright and brash, and motored by the fantasies of man. Outside, the dark rain fell on the potholes of the promenade. Inside, coloured light flickered amongst the maelstrom of symbols and melodies. The flashing of fruit machines shone out from the interior darkness, like neon fish in a gloomy aquarium. The arcade whispered riches and wealth amongst the piles of old and tired coins on the sliding machines. The place of money in this poor seaside resort, the arcade promised dreams. A gaudily painted mural ran above the entrance of the arcade. It depicted a young man holding a sword, its blade dripping with blood, standing beside a flame-haired girl. Both figures were looking down piteously at a dying woman, lying at their feet. It was a scene from the Greek myth of Electra, in which she persuades her brother Orestes to kill her mother in revenge for the death of her father. Running above the mural, written in fake Gothic lettering, were the words et in arcadio ego. The arcade held a certain fascination, Will could see that. It was only the huge 20-foot statue of a plastic clown laughing through the window that gave it away. The clown's oppressive dark red and green tones gave the figure a lugubrious, sinister quality. <coughs> the smiling, insane face was the front of money and greed. Ostensibly, the clown was to lure children in, like the child catcher of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with his lollipops, but in reality, it was a giant toy for the grown-up children. A few Trenton boys in their early teens were hanging about on bikes outside the amusement arcade. They had the faces of 40-year-olds on lean, stricken bodies, as if they had snatched at their futures too soon. Will wondered if they were dealing drugs. They had both energy and amorality, like indiscriminate gods. But there was one fair-haired boy whose impassivity set him apart from the others. So, shall I read a little bit more, Hamish? Or? Um, so, um, still his search for Louise Verver, um, that evening, Will decides to go and visit um, a pub called Granny's Attic and um, he doesn't seem to be getting any closer to finding out what's happened to her. Um, memories are coming back to him of something that's happened in his own past um, to do with his daughter going missing and this case seems to be taking on echoes of what happened to Will in his, um, his a few years ago ten years ago in his own life. Um, he thinks perhaps that um, the local protection racket might be involved in, in Louise going missing and he knows that they also visit Granny's Attic, which is the name of this pub, which actually used to be really there in Portobello but has now closed down. I did actually shamelessly use um, quite a few of the places in Portobello um, where I live. 
Um, but I had to live there a while before I could actually use them, because otherwise it can come across a bit like a travel brochure, you know, if you <laughs> use um, a place that you know, I think it needs to seep into you a bit and then come out slightly transformed or somehow you've picked up the emotional resonances of the place rather than the literal geographical um, details of it. Um, so Granny's Attic really was an amazingly atmospheric place, but I, f I found I could only write about it many years afterwards. That evening after eating, Will felt restless and decided to visit Granny's Attic, a drinking den on the promenade he sometimes frequented. It was on the first floor of a Victorian tenement block. He climbed up the gloomy steps into a wooden floored room with subdued lighting and basic wooden chairs and tables. The smell of alcohol and sweat merged with the trace of oversweet perfume. One or two men nursed drinks at the side tables, their faces unrecognisable in the gloom. When the lights illuminated their faces, they looked old and scared. A waitress with dyed blonde hair, mouse-like features and a buxom body, who'd been standing by the small bar, came over to him and took his order. She brought a small whiskey to him, then she hovered. Here on your own, she asked in a husky voice, her brash blonde hair at odds with her small featured face. Will sipped the whiskey, savouring the acrid taste. It's the only way to be, he said. She laughed, oh come on, no one likes to be on their own. Everyone needs a little company now and then. She reached out and touched his hand and looked straight into his eyes. He was surprised by the look in her pale blue gaze, a loving maternal look, full of affection. What's your name? Nancy. Well, Nancy, let me tell you this. I've been on my own for many years. I've got used to it. It suits me. Nancy appeared visibly taken aback by his cold tone. And shall I tell you why, he continued, because human company smells of old food in a fridge. That, Nancy, is why I like to be on my own. Now, how much is the whiskey? Two pounds seventy-five. Giving her three pounds, he told her, keep the change. Slowly and deliberately, she extracted some coins from the leather pouch around her waist and counted out 25 pence. You keep the change. You look like you need it, she said. She let the coins drop one by one with a clatter on the table next to his drink and walked away on her high heels. Will took another sip of the peaty liquid. A middle-aged couple sat down opposite him. They sat close together with the hunted, euphoric look of the unfaithful, as if a romantic song was constantly playing inside their heads as background music to whatever they did. Will looked at them pityingly. He liked to do pity. It made him feel better. Nancy came and went as she took their order, studiously ignoring Will. Neon spotlights switched on above the stage floor and coloured lights of bright yellow, green and red started to encircle the floor. A jazz version of Mr. Sandman came on through the amplifier. A singer would be due on soon. The music a signal that the show was soon to begin. Will took a gulp of his whiskey. The previous squalor and general emptiness of the room, now seen through the veil of drink and flashing lights and music, were taking on a fuzzy, attractive glow. What was he wanting from all this, he wondered, the whiskey burning his throat. Time passed, and Will became lost in a maze of memories, images of the past, past flickering across his vision. Then the singer walked onto the stage. She was wearing a sleeveless platinum evening dress, the sequins shining in a pattern of rainbow lights. It was as if she were made of metal, he thought, metal wrought from the hard resilience of her youth. As she started swaying to the music, she began to sing. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Make him the cutest I've ever seen. Give him two lips like roses and clover. Then tell him that his lonesome nights are over. While outside the sea and wind howled. A peroxide blonde, the singer had eyes so blue, a vivid, unreal blue, that they made his heart miss a beat. But above all, the youth of her, the soft, luminous skin, the limpid eyes, the slender arms. He was halfway to death, and now this young woman had walked into his life out of the blue. He had come across her, and for a moment her hard platinum look 
seemed to dissolve into the neon light of the disco, her body fragmenting into atoms of colour, becoming a diffuse swaying of light. Her voice had become the only substantial thing about her, as her body dissolved into its strong melody. However, as Will continued to stare, he saw a hardening in the lapidary eyes, noticed the lips darkening until they became the colour of blood. Her body was swaying to the solitary music of her own introverted desire, and his heart sank. What had he been thinking of? A moment of hallucinatory and possible longing. Having finished her song, the singer quickly left the stage and Will decided to return home. As he walked down the corridor out of Granny's attic, he noticed the same fair-haired boy he'd seen outside the arcade walking towards him. Will was not particularly surprised. Arbitrariness had become his god, a chimerical god that constantly changed its shape, and Portobello was a small place. As the boy was wearing his iPod, he seemed oblivious to the detective. Will could hear the tinny sound of electro music leaking from his earpieces. Will ducked into the darkness, then followed the boy backstage into the dressing room. The boy knocked on the door and handed over to the singer the package that Mikhail had slipped him. Mikhail is part of the protection racket in Portobello. Will wondered, again, what was in the package. Drugs were a failure of the imagination, a catastrophic destruction of dreams. Sure, drugs had their own fantasy, but it was not your own. It was a collective imagination that left the individual's dreams undreamt. It was like paying for someone else to dream for you. But the singer didn't strike him as someone who wanted anyone else's dreams, but Mr. Sandman's. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps we could talk a little and then I could do a final reading, Hamish. No, that's fine. And, uh, we'll see if anyone has any questions as well. The, the, often your novels deal with uh, themes of identity and kind of metaphysics and kind of broader, broader kind of questions kind of bubbling beneath, beneath the surface. There's, um, I mean, it's intriguing that you you describe your detective as existential, yes. which is an overtly kind of loaded philosophical concept with a, with a, long, a long history. Yeah, I have no and idea what I've done. So, 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 it, in what way is your detective? Oh, hey, Mitch. Um, well, first of all, I think I kind of the reason why I chose the title. Part of me found it quite funny, you know, because um, it is rather. It's almost tautological, you know. I think detectives automatically seem to be on their own, um, have their own subjective world vision, have their own sense of individual justice. Certainly, the archetype of the American detective. So if you like, calling my hero the existential detective was really just a homage to the lone detective with their own sense of morality, often at the expense of the conventions of um, officialdom, whether it's a police force or lawyers. You'll find in a lot of that type, that genre, the detective will be forging his own path, which often undermines or um, goes round about the official path that a, um, law enforcers would like him to take. So by calling him existential, I was sort of trying to do two things. On the one hand, look at the, prag the pragmatic aspect of following your own sense of justice. But I suppose also picking up on what you say about it being metaphysical it is a way of being as well, um, which also fits in with the idea of, of the the loneliness of the detective, the sense that um, his vision is very individualistic, it's often, um, it's not conservative, it's not, um, it doesn't subscribe to um, general convention. So as really using the word in, in both senses, the philosophical, um, and therefore, though you might disagree with this emotional, um, aspect of my detective, but also in terms of the political. It's our sense in which he is, he's, his, his destiny is free for him. 
because there, there's a tension there yes. between a, a character and a novel where you have determined his future. So there's no way this detective could be free in any kind of radical sense. And so, so there's, I wonder how you, how you portray that kind of, that um, I mean, freedom we'll get to, of his kind of personality. Whether he's got free will or not. I mean, that, that, that's getting to the realm of, um, you know, metaphysical, I mean, kind of literary theory, isn't it, and postmodernism. And, um, in fact, my immediate reaction to that, as I think many writers will tell you, is that it does feel like often your character has absolute free will. I mean, when I start writing um, a novel, I have no idea what's going to happen with my character. I don't have a sense of predestined plot for him. So when I had the idea for Will, um, I had no idea what a, what a mess he was going to make of his life. <laughs> I quite liked him and I felt sorry for him. And, but then as the plot progressed, I realised that he, his capacity to become involved in the darkness that he found himself in um, was inevitable. But whether, you could say I suppose that was my, the predestination of my unconscious. Um, but as a writer, I, I, I did feel that he had utter self-will. And I think um, writers do often, certain writers, um, right from from the unconscious, and therefore there is a feeling that um, the book has its own um, ordained way of progressing that I have no influence over. Though I know that is a an illusion. The, I was wondering. I mean, you are developing uh, a canon of works now, um, with with all. And I was wondering. When you read the books, you can often kind of see themes kind of getting picked up, kind of across them, or you can see kind of influences from one book to the next. I was wondering, do, are, you, are you beginning to see any kind of internal relations between between your novels, or and specifically existential detective? Are there any themes that you think you've you've picked up from? That is a words, fascinating question. Like just or yes, or um, I think you know, having studied. Um, Henry James in my thesis, I became very aware of how often certain writers have um, ideas that they keep picking at. Um, sometimes they just keep writing the same book, uh, but in a different <laughs> guise, different plot, different characters. But there's a central theme that seems repetitive. Um, and thinking about my work, I do think though it's one recurring theme throughout, which is Actually, Linda might be a chance to respect her than me, but um, he's in the audience. Um, I think it's one of subjectivity and how um, reality and imagination can become confused and how um, sometimes people have, have difficulty. This is, again, a philosophical point, isn't it? What's real and what's not. I think it's my interest in reality. Um, um, where often my books... The imagination of the protagonist, especially my latest, Burnt Island, uh, which is about this very subject, um, it actually became the theme of the book ostentatiously rather than surreptitiously, as in my previous books. It's about a writer who comes to an island who's trying to write a horror story and he gets writer's block and in fact what happens instead is imagine his imagination um, starts to create the events that are happening on the island. So it's, it's writ large this theme of this narrow line between what is real and, and our subjective vision. So I would say in, in all my books there is this confusion, um, whether unstated or in bad time and made explicit, um, between people's subjective vision and the um, material world. That's good, thank you. Can I open, I'll open the conversation up to okay. any questions? Or? Going back to the character of William Blake, like you said that he, he's kind of not of your norm, he doesn't subscribe to the general convention. Like, How did you find that as a writer to put yourself, make yourself well and, and kind of, I don't know, I express how he was feeling? Did you find it difficult to... That's a good question. I think it's funny, it's, it's something that's just occurred to me if you ask that question actually. Um, I think writers often feel a bit like existential <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the I came across just the other day 
you know, definition of writer is someone who notices things. <laughs> and I think, you know, obviously that's what detectives do too. So it's incredibly easy in a, on one level for me to imagine that, um, the, the state of mind required to be a detective. I mean, I, I say at, at one point in the book, you know, he's someone who, who reads other people's faces. They don't read his. I mean, it's a sense of the outsider observing the world. And, and as a writer, I think you'll find that on the whole, writers tend to watch rather than engage. It's kind of what we do. And I think as a detective, he has to follow people down narrow alleyways. You know, he, he, he observes, he, he tries to work out meanings. He tries to read into events what the plot could be, which is really analogous to the work of, of a novelist. Um, and I think there's a sense also very much as a, as a writer, you, you do feel on, on the outside of society. Um, what, what the chicken and egg thing, I'm not sure whether you feel outside society and therefore you become a writer or whether you become a writer and then you start observing. It's probably a bit of both. But I think it was quite easy for me to, to get into Will's um, way of seeing, the way, way of observing in that detached way. And again, that wonderful thing, way that life has of you thinking you could remain detached, mm. but actually, of course you can't. You're, you're a part of, of life and it drags you in whether you like it or not. And I think, again, it's another illusion that you have, will has, and I think as a writer you can have too, that somehow you can remain above your creation or the world that you've constructed with in fact as I said before it does drag you in and your unconscious drags drags you into your story as well. So I'm trying to think of that areas of will that I found more difficult to imagine. I mean his child has gone missing and um, I suppose having a child of my own um, I, I, I couldn't really get to that stage. I suppose I did kind of imagine what it might be like but it was so painful yeah. I don't think I um, really fully engaged with that, but I certainly engaged with a sense of love for his child uh, and how love for your child is often connected with a fear of loss. Um, he is, but I think, and, and he does in the end, he does commit a murder, uh, but again it was through a sense of revenge and justice. So I suppose on one level, um, and it was to do with the loss of his child, so then I, I could really understand that too. Um, um, and I think the fact that he was a man um, didn't really cause too many problems. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering about, um, in many of your books, and including in, in this one, you address quite taboo topics, what could yes. be seen as taboo topics. And I was just wondering how you, if certain stories draw you to certain types of taboo, like incest or, you know, crossing, you know, personal boundaries or things, or if, um, say in this case with a detective story, there's particular taboo topics that, that fit really well, or how you go about choosing them. It's a really I mean, that is um, such an interesting question, um, and um, it, it's quite difficult to answer. I mean, it's a weird thing, coming back to this idea of the unconscious, because I, I, certainly Justine, which deals with, with um, was trying to rewrite Dessart and has sadism and masochism in it, and as you say, there seems to be themes of incest in both Burnt Island um, and The Existential Detective. Um, I, it's it's a it's a difficult question to answer. I, often I will write a book and and I just it's almost like I it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> so in a way I, I, f I feel I can't I can hardly answer that honestly. You know it just seems to be subjects that I am interested in. I think I suppose it comes back to you know the story of Oedipus. You know some of the great archetypal myths deal with these kind of very taboo subjects. Um, I suppose I've always been quite interested in, in the dark side of um, humanity as a way perhaps of trying to make sense of it. Um, 
but I can't really answer. I think um, you'd need to ask a psychotherapist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, can't, I, can't, I suppose my answer is really that I don't choose them. Mm -hmm. I don't choose these subjects. They seem to come out of, um, often I'll start a novel with an image or a place very much, or a sense of atmosphere. Um, often place is very important to me, like Portobello with um, the existential detective, Shetland influenced Bird Island, London influenced Justine. Um, and then there'll, there'll be a certain event that will trigger a plot, but the taboo aspect of the plot will, will, seems to come from the progression of the plot. Um, I never start off a book deliberately thinking, how can I make this taboo? It, 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 it just doesn't work at all like that. Well, it sits very much on that boundary, doesn't it? The taboo sits on the edge of something, so if you're exploring questions of reality and imagination, I think, then, then the, the taboo sits on the realm of I the, think, the, 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 the norm and the exception. So, you, I think, so yeah. you, 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 you push that edge when you, when you enter the imaginative worlds of these characters and, and kind of explore their actions. I think that's absolutely right. I think that would be another way of answering it, because as I come back to the central theme of looking at the boundary between reality and imagination and taboos seem to do that too. Because a lot of taboos are about repressed desire. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Which came first, Portobello or the novel? Did you sort of <clears throat> your experience in Portobello, did you start to see characters and ideas come forth, or was it these ideas and characters were starting to build up over your life in general and you're like, Portobello is where they play out? Or, I don't know. It's, I mean, I think it definitely comes from a sense of place, and um, I'd lived in Portobello for 10 years and hadn't thought about writing about it, and it's very difficult to explain um, the sort of symbiotic um, event that happens when you think I've got something that can be turned into a novel but it, it was I think it was almost simultaneous feeling of someone walking down the promenade and it being a seaside resort and this lone figure and then out of that came the idea of a detective and that probably triggered ideas also my memories of seeing Atlantic City with Burt Lancaster and the atmosphere that that could evoke using a, a seaside resort. Um, but the, definitely the place has to seep into me first before I can think about writing it. Um, but it's almost like a catalyst that happens. Um, and again, this is where the unconscious comes in too. I think it had been brewing probably for a few years. You know, and I've obviously noticed all these places that I do write about in Portobello, and they all miraculously um, sort of came together to form a, a story. You have the hotel um, where the, the brothel is, which I hasten to add, it's not a brothel in Portobello. <laughs> the hotel <laughs> is amazing. And you've got the Hammer House, Gothic um, houses down the promenade where the parents of Louise Verver, the missing woman, live, which again are just sort of given to me as a writer. You know, they're there. I mean, I think. Any writer will say they will use bits of real life as a, as a, as a um, stepping, um, as a springboard for ideas. Um, so that's really what happened with, with Portobello. It, it, in a way, it's my easiest book to write because I had all these ciphers, all these images which I could then extrapolate and expand on. Um, and I think it's more difficult to write books purely from the imagination. Faros, my third novel about um, a lighthouse keeper in the 19th century, a ghost story, um, involved research. And that's another way that a writer can help themselves, if you like. If you read research about lighthouses and lighthouse keepers, that can help um, with ideas for prog progressing the plot or themes, so the, the themes of lightness Light and dark became prevalent in Faros, and um, Cameron, the, the, the lighthouse keeper, his interest in Gnosticism 
um, also fitted into the idea of good and evil. Polarity, it's a book of, of, of polarities. So, um, real life, research, imagination can all work together to help you construct a world. But I think it's an unusual writer that can create a totally fictional world. Even science fiction, um, I think some of the best science fiction will use aspects of our social reality to then um, reimagine a, um, a futuristic world. Pandora's box is set in America. Yes, mm. yes. And the, that's and how do you imagine that world of the deserts? That's another really interesting um, because I used America. I mean, I used. I went on a on a road trip um, through the desert and down to Las Vegas, and it was it's it was it, in fact Pandora's box. I think it's not the nearest get to a kind of science fiction world in an odd way. It's very, it's quite, um, in a way it's one of my favourites of, of my books actually, because it's kind of, you can't really fit it in to any um, place or, or any genre I suppose in a way, I don't know if you'd agree with that, but um, there's a psychic detective there, another detective, um, but um, she's psychic and um, Noah, my hero, who's a plastic surgeon, he, he discovers a burning woman on his doorstep and this rewriting of the Pygmalion myth as a plastic surgeon, um, rebuilds her and turns her into his perfect woman um, called Pandora and then she goes missing. So the rest of the book is Noah travelling through the desert um, trying to find what's happened to her with the help of Venus, who's a psychic detective. Um, who falls in love with him. But I use the desert and Las Vegas. Las Vegas overwhelmed me. I remember going there and just, it was so overwhelming, I just had to go to my hotel room <laughs> <laughs> and stay there for two days. It was just, it was incredible, the noise, the, 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 the fabrication of the place, you know, the fake history. It was amazing. and. Um, so, so I did use quite a bit of my um, experiences, experiences of Las Vegas in Pandora's box. Um, not to bombard you with questions about Portobello, but just, <laughs> <laughs> just writing about it change how you, you think about it. I mean, I guess you're kind of, again, in living there, sort of playing the existential detective, but then after you write about it and explore it, does it change the way you view the setting? It does we see actually, Will yeah, it, it, funny enough it really does, I could, I, it does, you know, I, I go past places and, and think, oh that's where that happened, you know, <laughs> in that book, and that's where that happened, and it does become a bit confusing. <laughs> um, yeah, it does, it, I haven't been asked that before, yeah, it, it, um, it does, I wouldn't say in a good or a bad way, just in a way, it makes me feel like I know Portobello more than I do, probably, because mm -hmm. um, I've constructed this fictitious story about it, and I think I go around Portobello thinking that's what really happened. <laughs> um, so it does make it feel a bit denser as a place. Yeah. I have one more question yeah, about style, great. because of course with the detective novel, there's quite the you could say a rather formulaic way to have the plot progression or things like that, but you, I think you managed to, to retain some sense of individuality within that form. But I was, I was just curious how how you approached it when you were writing. If, if you thought you, I needed consciously to tick these boxes, or how, yeah. Yeah. So you mean Linda, um, you saying, you mean that the, the form of the genre? Do you mean? The form of the genre and and I guess your own writing style, as in like the, because personally I think that you have quite a lyrical style of of writing, but but often I find especially writing or watching detective shows or things like that, they 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 hinge on the cliche, yeah. right? You yeah. know those those key phrases yeah. and statements that they can just yeah. throw out. So I was I was I guess I'm curious if you found yourself gravitating towards that. I, I think I definitely did. Oh. I think I definitely did. I think um, and I was happy to, you know, in a way I do because I'm such a fan of detective writing, I kind of like the cliches of the dead body mm. being washed up on the beach and 
Um, whiskey in the bar. Yeah, or you can yeah. keep the change, darling. Like that's yeah, exactly, you know. exactly. Um, the prostitute. <laughs> um, Will, I mean, Will is a walking cliche in many ways. Mm. Um, as the existential detective, as, a, as we started talking about you know, the title, you know, the tautological quality of of it all. So, I suppose I'm definitely pulled towards those. Um, I think there's spokes on the wheel, if you like, a plot where you you the, you can impale yourself on these <laughs> these cliches. Um, hopefully not sort of irretrievably, but um, yeah, I kind of I find them attractive. I suppose I suppose it comes back to the idea of taboo as well and myth. All these recurring ideas, whether of um, mythological or genre, they're all archetypes, I suppose, aren't they? And so I suppose I'm not afraid of them, and perhaps I should be more afraid of them, you know, I don't know. Um, I often read about writers saying, oh, I hate cliches, you know, it's like well, their cardinal rule, avoid cliches. And something which I particularly like about Henry James is he will take a cliche and he'll reinvent it. Mm -hmm. And his cliche, he'll use cliches, but they will mean, they will be so resonant. And um, so I, I'm quite drawn to cliches. Just in that um, extract I read out about the singer and her, her coming out of the blue. You know, that's a cliche, coming out of the blue. But I just really love what that means. If you, if you take the resident meaning of that, you know, a surprise in one's life, something that takes one, puts you in a, in a different direction, that the unpredictability of our lives, the, the, the um, you know, the, the, the frightening uh, irrationality, if you like, of what may or may not happen to us. And so you can take a cliche like that and also using the idea of her blueness, her blue eyes, which in, as you will find through the story, are actually not really the colour of her eyes. So, I mean, you can make a cliché work um, in so many ways, so many um, ways that are much more than that cliché. So, I suppose it's a sort of the enfant terrible quality of, it, of wanting to take a cliché and say, you know what, even though this is a cliché, I'm going to use it and I'm going to use it in my way. and. Um, so I'm quite a fan of cliches. <laughs> Thanks. Here's a quick question about the, the singer. Um, mm. So obviously we're kind of questioning throughout the book, like, who is this woman really? And um, I, 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 it was a few months ago I read the book, so excuse me if I'm wrong, but she says at one point she's from Chicago, is that right? What was kind of the reasoning behind that idea of her being American. I don't and that's reason because it's it's a windy city, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, she's not really American. Mm -hmm. She's actually, um, well, I won't tell the same thing. She's not American. <laughs> so her her accent is fake. So I suppose it was a way of trying to um, um, pull the wool another cliche, pull the wool over Will's eyes. So I thought giving her, making her American would make it more difficult for him to work out who she really was. Mm -hmm. So that's why I made her American. I suppose perhaps also, you know, the fact that it is the, the genre of the detective story, you have the hard-boiled Vitlana Turner or, you know, those wonderful femme fatales of, of the Raymond Chuck, the big sleep. And mm -hmm. I suppose that was in the back of my mind by making her American. Okay. But of course, she's not American and she's not really hard-boiled, you know. Um, <laughs> and. So that's so she's she a, she's fraudulent, I suppose. I think, uh, I think that's uh, that's uh, we'll we'll wind up there. All and, right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank, thank you. Very much. Right. <laughs> Thanks very much.